Our scripture text this morning is from Luke chapter 9, verses 51 through 56. When the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers ahead of him who went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make preparations for him. But the people did not receive him because his face was set toward Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them, and they went on to another village. God desires his church to love the nations, and therefore we want to love the nations. It's the desire of your church leaders. So we're going to take a break for one week uh, from the book of Galatians as we've been studying the pure gospel, and we're going to consider how the pure gospel is meant to reach the nations, and we're grateful that it does. Now, our text today in Luke chapter 9 probably needs a little bit of background since we are parachuting into a gospel narrative. We need to know a little bit of where it's been and where we are headed in the text. Luke 9.51 serves as a hinge in Christ's ministry. He has been serving now for two and a half years around the Galilee region. He has been ministering and displaying his power. He has been setting up his disciples to follow him. He has been showing the world that he has power over disease and over the creation itself. He even has power over death as he raises the widow's son and Jairus' daughter. But in Luke 9, 51, his attention turns towards Jerusalem. He's been ministering throughout the region, and now he is setting his face towards his ultimate purpose, which is the cross. And so this is a hinge in the text for us. He is teaching his disciples something along the way. In Luke 9, 18... Jesus asks an important question to his disciples. Who do you say that I am? The disciples say, you're not John the Baptist, you're not Elijah, you are in fact the Christ of God. This explicit confirmation is important for the text because from here, Jesus says that he's going to die. And then he says it again in Luke 9, 44 and 45. He's telling the disciples something. He's telling them what it's like to go and to die. From Luke 9, 51 to Luke 19, 27, Luke fills the pages with discourse of what it's like to follow Jesus. So in the first part of the ministry, from 414 to Luke 9, 50, Jesus says, I have come to give salvation to the poor, to release the captive, He shows his power, and as he sets his face on Jerusalem, he is now going to be teaching his disciples of what it looks like to actually follow him, not just walk with him, but follow him in his example. So in this, we see this great, deep level of mercy that is flowing from Christ as he turns his face towards Jerusalem. So from our passage this morning, as Christ turns his attention to Jerusalem, he is on this mission of mercy, and it's it's flagrant in the text as he sets his face, as the words say. Today we're going to consider two different parts of this text. The first thing we're going to consider is the message of mercy. He's going to Jerusalem to display this message of mercy. The second thing we want to see from this text today is two responses to this message of mercy. How do people actually respond to Jesus setting his face to go to Jerusalem? So the message is this. 
He's going to die. It's not fully understood yet, but that is the message as we sit on this side of the resurrection. When he sets his face there, this is exactly what is occur- occurring. Jesus did not just end up in a bad spot before the Sanhedrin. He wasn't just deceived by one of his followers who betrayed him. We know that the Lamb of God was slain before the foundation of the world in Revelation 13, 8. And as the days drew near for him to be taken up, he sets his face to go there. So he chose this. He knew that it was occurring. This was the ultimate obedience to the Father, the ultimate love for his people. He chose the public mockings, the deep, intense physical suffering that he endured on behalf of his people. He endured a spiritual agony unlike has ever been done in all of human history as he drank in the full wrath of God for the curse of sin. And not only did he choose these things, he actually designed it because he is the God of the universe. Colossians 1.16 tells us that all things were created by him and through him. So he chose these things to endure, but he also designed them. He made the tree that he would die on as he sets his face to go to Jerusalem. He formed the thorn bush that would pierce his brow. He shaped the rock in which the metal for the nails would be extracted. This is an intense love that Jesus is displaying, this message of mercy. And why did he do this? Well, he did it because humanity is deserving of God's wrath because of our sin. All of us have gone astray, each to his own way. All of us have fallen short of the glory of God and the penalty of sin, the wage of sin is death. So he did this. It should have been us who have received the full wrath of God. If you've been walking with Christ for any amount of time, you've heard the gospel over and over again, we know that this is something that we deserve. But Christ is walking towards it. And in God's infinite mercy, he provides a lamb of royal blood who would appease his wrath and would reconcile us to the Father. And those who by grace through faith in Christ alone, are, made, are now made new. So certain death awaits Christ in this narrative, and he sets his face towards it. Like a champion, certain of victory, he's walking straight towards death. And the text says he didn't flinch. He was immovable. That's what... It set his face towards Jerusalem means. Isaiah 57 prophesies that this is what it would be like. He set his face like flint. Flint was a hard gray rock that was used uh, in ancient times to shape utensils and specifically weapons of warfare. His face was stiff. It was immovable. It was like a rock that wasn't going to go anywhere. Listen to what Isaiah chapter 50, verse 6 and 7 says. I gave my back to those who strike and my cheeks to those who would pull out the beard. I hid not my face from disgrace and spitting, but the Lord God helps me. Therefore, I have not been disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like flint and I know that I shall not be put to shame. Behold, this is our, this is our Lord who set his face towards Jerusalem. Now, remember, Christ is fully God, and he is also fully man. He enjoyed the things of life as well. He had meaningful relationships with family members. He had deep conversations and times of laughter with his disciples. I'm sure he preferred certain foods and drink. He was fully Human. He did not enjoy pain. Sometimes we just think of God 
the, the fullness of, of, of God in Christ is just walking towards this because he's God, but we also have to remember that he's man. He's giving up things in order to accomplish certain things, and he did not dole the pain to do it, but he absorbed the full wrath of God on our behalf. So how is this possible? Hebrews 12, 2 says, For the joy set before him, he endures the cross. When death and suffering are impro- approaching, he is looking through the cross, Matthew Henry says. Looking through the elements of suffering, awaiting a glory that is forthcoming. And so we see that he is looking at it because he knows he's going to be taken up. Look in the text again. It says, when the days drew near to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. We believe that this phrase, he was taken up, means both his, ra- his, his resurrection and his ascension. There is no coronation, there is no crown without the cross, so the way that he looks through the cross is that he knows that a coronation and a, cross and, and a kingship are forthcoming. And he sets his face to this. He knows that there's hope on the other side of this. 1 Timothy 3.16 says that he is taken up in glory after being vindicated by the Spirit and seen by angels and proclaimed amongst the nations and believed on in the world. He was taken up in glory. How often do you consider his journey to the cross? We often think about Christ dying on the cross for our sins. But what about the anguishing, probably six-month journey in which he is thinking about the cross after he has set his face towards it? Thinking about the suffering forthcoming forthcoming, thinking about the sins that each of us are guilty of, constantly before him as he perseveres in this immovable spirit to take on the wrath of God on our behalf. This is the message of mercy. He's going to die. But he's also teaching his disciples something in the meantime, as he's walking on this travelogue on the way to Jerusalem, he's going to be teaching them what it looks like to follow him. Christ says that the demand to follow me requires a cross as well. We too make a journey to Jerusalem bearing a cross. Now, we look at a different Jerusalem, and we look at the new Jerusalem where Christ reigns, but he is constantly before us. It says in Luke 9, 23, just a few verses before our text today, if you want to come after me, you must deny yourself and you must pick up your cross. The cross that we bear, however, is not a cross of atonement or redemption. Christ bore that cross, and he is the only one qualified to do so. But we do walk a narrow path, and we will suffer as Christians. Jesus promises us this in John 15. You know, remember the world hated me, but it hated me before it's going to hate you. Samuel Rutherford, a Scottish pastor from the 19th century, or the 17th century says, Christ has borne the whole cross, and his saints bear only chips. Bonhoeffer says, the cross is not the terrible end to an otherwise God-fearing and happy life, but it meets us at the beginning of our communion with Christ. When Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. We follow Christ in this journey. His face is set towards Jerusalem, and ours is set on the king of Jerusalem. This intersection of faith in Christ and sacrifice and obedience that his followers um, have, we learn the very heart of Christ. We learn who he is as we follow after him. 
The temptation for us who know the gospel and have been following Jesus for, ta- for some time is to think that because Christ has died to set us free from sin, that there is no more need for suffering. There is no more need to pick up our own cross and follow him. But Paul says we fill up what is lacking in Christ's suffering. Now, he's certainly not talking about atonement as we've already established. But as the, gener- as the gospel goes from generation to generation... And we proclaim the gospel. The church then demonstrates what the gospel is through our obedience, suffering, and love. We fill up what is lacking from generation to generation. We pick up the cross. We make disciples. We baptize them, identifying with Christ in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we show them what union with Christ looks like as we also proclaim the gospel to them. This is the message of mercy. And if we don't understand the message of mercy, it's very hard to understand the rest of the text. For the Christian, I hope the message of mercy sits on us afresh every day. I hope that we recognize that our king has walked towards Jerusalem on our behalf. And if we've learned it when we were a child, I hope that it's still fresh to us when we're in our 80s. As we consider the love and the passion and the sacrifice of our king on our behalf as he makes that journey to Jerusalem. And then the joy it is to walk in the same direction that he is going as we follow after him, carrying this message with us. And secondly, we want to see these two responses to this message of mercy. Look with me in 52. And he sent messengers ahead of him who went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make preparations for him. But the people did not receive him because his face was set toward Jerusalem. Now, some disciples went ahead of Jesus who was making his journey from the Galilee region, which was north of Jerusalem, about about by 80 miles. And between the two was the kind of the the country of Samaria or the, the, the property of Samaria. And so if they were going to take a straight line from Galilee where they had been ministering to where Jesus was going to be dying, they were going to go right through Samaria. So as they came to the very first village in Samaria, they wanted to send, kind of being nice, they wanted to send forward messengers to say, hey, there's a band of at least 13 who are coming. This would be important for housing accommodations, food. It was a kind gesture. Now, we recognize that the first response to this message of mercy was rejection. This Samaritan village rejected Jesus from coming to them. It says in 53, they did not receive him. So in not receiving him, this actually forced the disciples and and Jesus to walk around Samaria, and they actually went outside the Jordan River and ultimately went down into Jericho and then ultimately to to Jerusalem. What should have been an 80-mile journey ended up being a 90-mile journey for Jesus and the disciples because they were not welcome in this village. That would be like for us here, walking Uh, 80 miles would be like from Christ Covenant Church to downtown Greensboro. That's the journey that they were going on. And on the way, they were diverted around because they were not accepted. Now, this requires some background for us. After the Assyrians conquered the northern kingdom of Israel in 721 B.C., a remnant of the Jews remained in the northern kingdom. And the Assyrians brought people who ultimately mixed with the Jews and had children, and children had children. And ultimately, this gave birth to the Samaritans. And the Samaritans were considered half-breeds by the Jews. Samaritan was someone who was half-Jew and then half-Gentile. So literally, the entirety of humanity was inside of one people known as the Samaritans. Now, it, this is what Assyria used to do. They would go in to destroy a people, and they would make sure that their offspring no longer had a future by mixing with them. This was, tra- this was strategic by the, uh, by the Assyrians. 
And the Assyrians would um, come in and they would do this from province to province. And this is how they gained power throughout the region. Now, the Samaritans at first worshipped the false gods of the world. This is what they did until God sent in lions, we read in 2 Kings, to make judgment on the Samaritans for not considering God. Ultimately, he sent with him with them a priest who taught them the Mosaic law, but the scriptures say they never put away their foreign gods. They always had their eyes on God and then also the ways of this world. Now, Jews and Samaritans had deep hostility between them. I'm not talking about Red Sox-Yankees hostility. I'm not talking about Duke-Carolina hostility. I'm not even talking about state and Carolina hostility. I'm talking deep religious hostility, which resulted in different mountains to worship on, different liturgies altogether, different systems of worship. If you recall, in conversation between the Samaritan woman and Jesus in John chapter 4, we get to see a little bit about this when she says, my father's worshiped on this mountain. You seem to say we should worship in Jerusalem. And Jesus says, there's going to be a day where people worship in spirit and in truth. On neither mountain. But why did they reject him? It's because Jesus' face was set towards Jerusalem. Jerusalem is where the Temple Mount was. This is where the feast took place. The Passover took place. And Samaritans were not allowed to worship there. They worshiped on Mount Gerizim. And so as Jesus is heading to Jerusalem, they know that they're not allowed there and they don't want anything to do with anybody that is. On this side of the death and resurrection of Jesus, it's quite ironic to consider that Jesus is going to die for the sins of the world and the people he is going to die for are rejecting him in the village. They're not recognizing what it is that Jesus is doing. But before we jump on the Samaritans, remember there is a lot of Samaritan in us. Do you remember what Paul says in Colossians 1.21, and you who were alienated and hostile in mind doing evil deeds? This was us before we knew Jesus. We did not want him in our village. We did not want him on his throne. We really wanted nothing to do with him until he opened up our minds to understand who he was and why he was walking to Jerusalem on our behalf. I wonder if it's possible that some of you today are rejecting Jesus because you do not know where he is going or you do not like where he is going. For the non-Christian, you don't like the fact that Jesus is traveling to Jerusalem. You don't think he needs to go there. You haven't ever really considered why he's going there. For the Christian, uh, we don't like the fact that he's going to, to Jerusalem often because he's going to suffer. And we really don't want to have anything to do with that. And so in our flesh, oftentimes we try to escape. Now I want us to see the second response in verse 54. Now this is geared only towards the religious. So church, we must listen up. And when his disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them? What a statement, right? The question that these two disciples are asking actually reveals a lot about what they believe. Now, first, let's tip the hat to them because they are actually showing their loyalty to Christ. If someone is rejecting Christ, they are rejecting them. On the outset, that looks like it's a good thing. They're for Jesus. They think Jesus is who he says he is. They're traveling with him. There's a loyalty there. And they're walking with him. It also reveals, secondly, their faith. They think they can call fire down from heaven to consume their enemies. This is bold religiosity here. They're not just rejecting, they're, 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 
They're believing that Jesus is Jesus, and they believe that because Jesus is Jesus, they can do certain things by faith. Now, to their defense, probably just a few weeks before, James and John, along with Peter, stood on the mountain of transfiguration. They had seen Moses. They had seen Elijah. They had seen the glory of God transformed in the face of Christ. Moses representing the law. Elijah representing the prophets. And Jesus who fulfills both of these things. It had to have been top of mind as they spent time with Elijah. How Elijah called down fire from heaven and consumed 450 prophets of Baal. And as James and John considered that they had seen the kingdom displayed in the, uh, the glory of God in the face of Christ. They knew that they were walking towards Jerusalem. They knew that, that victory was certain. We've, we've got the better David. We've got the better Moses. We've got the better Elijah. He's right here. They're thinking victory is certain. They got trapped up in thinking about the gospel in the proper way. We see that if the Samaritans missed the message, or excuse me, if the Samaritans rejected the message, James and John and the disciples were missing the message, oblivious to the very spirit of Christ who came to serve and not be served. He came into the world not to condemn the world, but to save the world. Their postures reveal that they did not understand the way of Christ, despite knowing that Jesus was in fact the Christ. Think about that. They were missing the way of Christ, despite recognizing intellectually that this was the Christ. They had zeal for the things of God, but they did not have knowledge in the things of God. Zeal and passion in the name of God is not always godly. How true is it that when when we are attacked or someone attacks our loved ones, that our first impulse is to attack back, to defend? The Samaritans who had been rejected by Jews for centuries, rejected. The Jews who had just been rejected by the Samaritans, rejected. Samaritans and James and John in this instance are the very same. They're they're both discounting the other. Except James and John had been following Jesus, and if we're honest with ourselves, each of us, as we follow Christ, have rejected the very Christ that we follow as well. We defend Christ instead of responding like Christ. Ironically, our greatest defense of Christ is responding like Christ. Christ. A lot has been done throughout church history in the name of God that ultimately prove antithetical to the very heart of God. James and John did not yet understand that the correct response to the Samaritans would have been to love them, to pray for their enemies. And they had heard this up to this point already. They had considered what Jesus was saying on the Sermon on the Mount and the Sermon on the Plains. They just didn't understand what it meant yet. They didn't yet know the depths of their own sin and their own need for grace. They thought their position within ethnic Israel was more important than the position of those outside of Israel. James and John wanted all the benefits of the kingdom, like grace and mercy, a good seat, Next to Jesus in the new kingdom, retribution for all the enemies that have been against them, but the depths of their own sin had not yet been equated to the sins of their enemies. They failed to realize the depths of their own sin and how undeserving they were of grace. They did not understand the gospel. So my question for us today, for us to consider... What do you do with grace? What do you do with mercy? Do you receive it? 
but you don't want to give it? Do you think that grace is for the upright, but not the brokenhearted, the downcast, or the mixed? How we treat our enemies directly reveals our own beliefs about Christ and the gospel of grace. It reveals our own view of ourselves as well. Thinking of ourselves more highly than we ought. Look, I think we would all agree in this room that Christianity is not exactly popular in culture right now. But how we respond to the culture reveals what we understand about Christ and the gospel. Consider for a moment the difference between patriotism and nationalism. Patriotism is loving the country that you're a part of, grateful to God for it. Wanting it to thrive for human flourishing. Thankful to God for the freedom that we have to worship and opportunities we have to provide for our families. And inside that, we pray for our country. We advance the gospel inside of it. We want Christian politicians. We want faithful people leading and voting and being about the things that God would have us be about. But nationalism is something different. Nationalism brings Christian values and it sets it in immediate hostile contrast to the ways of this world. And what it ultimately reveals is that the goal is the nation and not the one who is over all the nations. As the nation rejects Christian values, does our response look like James and John? Look, Samaritans are everywhere, meaning everyone's rejecting Jesus on his way to die for the sins of the world. That's nothing new. How are we responding to the culture? It's an important question for us to wrestle with. Because the reality is this, Christ is still merciful to the nations. There will be a day when Christ returns and people defend their villages. And this time they're going to be speaking to a king and not a servant. And he will wipe them out if they reject him. But that day is not yet. We still live in the epoch of grace. The gospel is still the weapon of the day. And so we want to consider this as we consider the times in which we live, the spirit in which we live. Do you love your enemies? Do you pray for those who persecute you? Have you asked God to change your heart towards those who have rejected him so that you can defend the gospel, the very message of mercy, the way that Christ would have you. We slam social media a lot and just because we see a lot of this taking place inside of it right now. But I'm also asking the question of the heart. Forget, if, forget whether or not you're on social media. When something is said or something is done in rejection to your own values, what is your response at the very core? Because in that moment, we, def we decide or it, what's revealed is what we actually believe in terms of this mercy that Christ has done on our behalf. What a merciful action that Jesus has done walking to the cross to save both the Samaritan who is rejecting him and his disciples who are completely misunderstanding him, revealing their own sin in the process. Now, Christ has a response. I'm going to tuck this in, verse 55 and 56. Christ does have a response to both groups. 
But he turned and rebuked them. Verse 56, and they went on to another village. Notice that he didn't say anything to the Samaritans. And in fact, if you really do a survey of Christ's rebukes and corrective teaching, he's not speaking to the lost world. He is speaking to the religious, to those who have misunderstood who he is and what the gospel is all about, who have misunderstood their own sin in light of who he is. He rebukes them. Now, rebuke, I think this is the third week in a row, as Tom's been preaching through Galatians and he keeps talking about rebukes, I'm I'm, I'm sitting here thinking, I think that's in the text that I'm going to be bringing up as well. And I want rebuke to be considered here, just as Tom has and has been teaching us through Galatians, as a merciful thing. Just as it was for Peter, it turns out to be for James and John, and rebuke is merciful towards us as well. Look, discipleship is both informative and it's corrective. Without being corrected through the scriptures, we don't know what is true, or we continue to lie in the ways and the patterns in which we live. Now, we don't have time to go through it all, but I do want us to very quickly see in Luke 9.46, Luke 9.49, and Luke 9.55. So in nine verses, it's possible that John, the Apostle John, was corrected by Jesus three times. Luke 9.46 doesn't go into great detail, but it's when the disciples are wanting the better spot in the kingdom. Now, most scholars connect this to Mark chapter 10, which names specifically James and John, the sons of thunder, as as Jesus gave them description in in Mark chapter 3. They they had passion and zeal. They wanted to, to reign with God and rule with God. They wanted to defend God. And he says, I don't think you get what the kingdom of God is yet. Luke 9, 49, John is against this other person who's preaching and Jesus is like look if just because they're not a part of our group doesn't mean they're not a part of us he corrects him Luke 9 55 after he reveals his heart towards the Samaritans he wants them to be abolished wiped off face of the earth Jesus rebukes them rebuke is a blessing it can be merciful it's a part of this mission of mercy It's a part of the example that Christ lays out for us. Here's the reality. The rebuke that the Lord gives to James and John is our rebuke also. He's wanting us to consider the kingdom of God at his very pure sense, what Christ has done and the way in which we are to walk. And it reveals to us all the ways in which we don't walk this way. Now, the good news is, and we're going to say this in closing, discipline doesn't disqualify you. That's what makes it merciful. In fact, it prepares you. Because remember, after this rebuke, James and John and the disciples, they keep walking with Jesus They keep learning what the kingdom of God is. They keep being discipled by him. They keep heading towards Jerusalem with him despite not knowing fully the gospel. Christ is gracious and incrementally growing his people along in a process. And you and I are, are no different. This message of mercy truly changes people. And so I do want us to look at John for a moment in closing. The same disciple who is rebuked by Christ ultimately becomes the disciple who is most known in Scripture for his love and charity. Some short amount of time later, probably within the year, more likely six months, John is the one who is given responsibility to care for the mother of Christ upon his death. He continues walking with Jesus towards Jerusalem. He sees with his own eyes Jesus suffering for the sins of the world. He touches Jesus after his resurrection. 
He's a witness to the Spirit falling at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 and seeing how the gospel goes forward and the nations come and surround themselves with this gospel. They're surrounded and put together by this gospel. And we also see in Acts chapter 8 as a man named Saul goes into the city of Jerusalem to persecute the church, to wipe out the church. It creates a diaspora. The disciples flee in all different directions. And John, along with Peter, do you know where he goes? He goes to Samaria to minister to the people that he once wanted to abolish and wipe away because of his own religiosity his own misunderstandings, his lack of understanding of the gospel. And now he wants to take the most precious gift imaginable, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to the people who were once his enemies. The nations are in view here in Luke 9, 51 through 56. Samaritans who are rejecting him, religious people who don't understand him, and the Christ of the gospel who is walking through them on their way to Jerusalem, and then those who by faith trust in this Christ, then go and do likewise. They make the journey, they're shaped along the way, and radical things happen, like they begin loving those who they once considered an enemy. Church, I hope this is us. I hope we are marked by the Spirit in this way. You can kill the body all day long. You cannot harm the soul. We belong to this Messiah of mercy. And this is the gospel that we carry. I pray we carry nothing else. Let's take a few minutes to to pray, to consider these things before God. Ask yourself in prayer, do, do I love my enemy? Do I value the Messiah of mercy? Am I carrying this message of mercy? And may we ask for God's help to do so. Father, we do thank you today that Jesus walked to Jerusalem for us. Father, we have Samaritan all over us as we once rejected Jesus. Father, we are like James and John in many ways. God, would you be gracious to us to help us see the error of our way and recognizing that the greatest way that we can defend our Lord is by responding like him as we are united with him by faith. God, grow us into a maturity that John was able to reach. Father, and we'll give you all the praise and glory that's due your name. But our confession today is we recognize that we need you. And we praise you today because of the perfect and completed work of Christ our King. In whose name we pray, amen.